All right, welcome to chapter two, tools of the trade. So we're gonna start by talking about safety. Um, kind of a number one rule about safety is don't be stupid. I know it sounds crass maybe, but it's a great rule. Um, another way to think about it probably is don't be ignorant. When you go into a lab, make sure you understand exactly what you're working with and what you're going to be doing and maybe even think about the, uh, some byproducts that might occur from reactions that you're, that you're doing. Really know your stuff and look up literature, look up um, the safety data sheets for all this stuff that you're going to be working with and make sure you have a good idea of what's going on. I will probably tell you a few different personal things here. Um, as I go through this, uh, by personal, I mean I'm going to tell you times when I was stupid. And it's going to be public. And you'll just get to know when I was stupid. So let's go ahead and start with the first point. Wear personal protective equipment, in other words, PPE. So non-negotiables are going to be goggles and closed-toed shoes. So I actually lived in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, we wear something called slippers. You guys call them chunklas here. And I was wearing my flip-flops, and uh, the reason was, well, A, we were allowed to because it was Hawaii and nobody cared, and B, because my idea was, hey, if I wear flip-flops, then if I spill something on myself, I can rinse it off real fast, right? Um, that's not how it worked, and when I spilled concentrated nitric acid on my foot, and if this is me, so let's draw a picture of me, wearing my chunkless. That was my face. Ow! Um, because I spilled concentrated nitric acid on myself. No, I was able to get to the sink very quickly, but not before an entire layer of skin or two had been removed from my foot. So wear closed-toed shoes, okay? Non-negotiable. Goggles, always, absolutely. Um, a lot of people wear safety glasses. Those are okay in certain, uh, in certain cases generally when you're working with more solid type things. Um, but you normally, if you have anything that's going to splash, you're going to want to wear goggles um, or at least add an adaption to your safety glasses that has um, like wings on it to make sure that nothing gets in there. All right, know where things are in order to save you. Know where your sink is, your eye wash station, your fire extinguisher, your fire blanket, your acid spill kit, and your base spill kit at a minimum. Also, know how to use them. You live in a world um, where information is so readily available, there's no excuse not to know a lot of this stuff. So for example, um, I once taught high school and we actually made a, a little bomb just for funsies. And I made sure that my students were far outside the blast radius and that I had a fire blanket ready to go in any case and I made sure that I knew how to use it. So this is the kind of stuff that you just, just don't wanna be stupid with. Label everything. <laughs> my guess is if you're in analytical chemistry and you have already learned this lesson, you've already accidentally mixed a wrong thing uh, in with something else, when we get to analytical chemistry and beyond, suddenly you're working with stuff that's far more dangerous than in Gen Chem 1 or Gen Chem 2. This means if you pour the wrong thing into the wrong container, you could, you could create maybe a serious gas or something to that effect that could end up hurting you. So you want to write the names, the concentrations, in other words, the, mol uh, the molarities, the date which you made it, because oftentimes these things expire after a certain period of time, and put your name on it, especially if you're, you're in a lab with a lot of people. Things that should be in the hood, um, <laughs> you'll generally know this if you take something out of the hood that should be in the hood because you'll feel it right away. You'll breathe it right into your nostrils and you'll be like, wow, probably should have had that in the hood. You might have already experienced this. Make sure anything that's highly volatile, meaning it's evaporating very quickly, um, anything that's labeled concentrated, oftentimes they'll abbreviate it with conch, etc., are in the hood. You also want to use respirators when you're working with fine powders. Here's another stupid thing I used to do. So I made a cleaning product for the nuclear industry and, and one of the powders that we used was actually a, a, a really fine soap powder, SDS. And I was working with this really fine soap powder and it went everywhere, like everywhere. And I breathed it in and 
I, I felt sick for almost three or four days. I mean, I felt it just stuck in my, in, my, in my lungs and in my throat. It was really horrible. So make sure you use respirators when you're working with fine powders. Oftentimes, the, the actual chemical itself will tell you that. Ensure you properly dispose of any chemical waste. This is one of those things that's also non-negotiable. Um, if you don't know how to properly dispose of a particular waste, find somebody who does. Don't just pour it down the sink. Um, oftentimes, the water, um, water authorities or anyone who deals with water will come and test the water just outside of waste streams for universities, um, labs, etc. And they'll check to see if people are actually pouring things down the drain. And when they find it, they can be fined uh, a pretty substantial amount. This actually brings me back to here. I used to work for a university um, that, oh, not there, naming things. Um, I used to work for a university that didn't have labels on a lot of their, their materials. And some people just got lazy and they just start throwing things in the basement. Um, what ended up happening is it piled up over time. Um, there ended up being like a fire at one point in time and when People started investigating where the fire came from and why. Uh, they realized that there was tons of unlabeled stuff. The university got fined millions of dollars and it ended up <laughs> really hurting everyone. And because nothing was labeled, they had to dispose of each individual thing um, separately. And it was, it was just a horrible situation for that university. Thankfully, a lot of places are going towards green chemistry now. Green chemistry essentially is chemistry where it's environmentally a little more friendly um, than other chemical methods, so it's pretty cool. All right, let's move on to the lab notebook. Unfortunately, you guys aren't in class this semester, and so what happens when you're not in class is you don't actually have somebody standing over your shoulder telling you what to do. The three most important principles about a lab notebook is that you state what was done, exactly. You state what was observed, ah, what ass, what was observed, and you wanna make yourself understandable to someone else. Now this is the words of your book that's bothered me for a long time, be understandable to someone else. Grammatically that sounds goofy, but maybe it will help you remember it. Now, what my lab TA used to make me do is we had a carbon copy notebook. And what that means is when you write on one side, it actually goes through and makes a copy onto the other side. Um, so you can actually tear off the top sheet and hand it in or vice versa or tear off the bottom sheet, etc. And they also made me fold this paper in half. So on this side, I would write procedures And on this side, I would write observations. So I'd write what I was doing and then I'd write what um, I actually saw. And that was pretty helpful for me, um, being that I'm naturally not a fan of lab notebooks. I don't know if you guys are, and if you are awesome, and if you aren't, this is a really great way to keep your stuff organized. All right, now we're gonna talk about balance, analytical balance. All right, so. Typically, analytical balances will have a readability of about 100 to 200 grams. Uh, I think I posted that um, list of things that weigh about 100 grams. I thought it was pretty cute. Um, generally, that's about the weight of a mouse. If you haven't ever held a mouse, maybe you've held um, some strawberries, and it kind of relates that to, I think it says five strawberries, um, and it relates it to a whole bunch of of random things and it was just a cool article and I figured, hey, you guys should read that. Um, and that's just because you're probably not used to using um, any kind of metric system. This is an, an SI unit. The SI unit for mass is actually kilogram, but it's a derived unit and that's grams. Um, so generally uh, balances have a readability range of about 0.1 to 0.01 milligrams. Um, keep in mind it's milligrams, not grams. So we're talking about 0 0.0001 to 
to 0 0.000001 grams. So really, really small. Um, actually, I counted one extra zero here. My bad. Sorry about that. Um, really, really small. So you can, you, in other words, you can actually know uh, relatively accurately the mass of something down to four decimal places or even further. And this is general analytical balances. So what are some issues um, when you're massing things? Well, sometimes, for example, you'll, you'll put a beaker on an analytical balance so it looks like this and it will give you this really weird all these really weird characters and you're like what did I just do and um, that tends to be when you've actually overloaded it so that means maybe it's greater than the 200 grams or maybe sometimes 175 grams that's allowed and so you know that you've got to adjust um, whatever you're doing another case that's actually very common and you've probably dealt with this at some point is your mass might keep going up. So if you have a mass, for example, if you put your, your sample on top of an analytical balance and the mass goes up by like 0.1 grams, another 0.1 grams, another 0.1 grams, it's just going up and up and up and up and up, you probably have a sample that is hygroscopic. In other words, it's just soaking up water. And we'll actually talk about desiccants. Desiccants are hygroscopic as well in a little bit. But what that means is soaking up water from the atmosphere. In this case, you want to weigh by difference. So, I believe, let's see, you have a, uh, I think it's a, like, a lab number five, where you're actually going to be needing to weigh something by difference. And when I say you're needing to, I mean will weigh something by difference for you, and you can watch it. Um, but what that is, is you're actually going to have a sample inside the container. And usually you even want to keep the lid on in the container. And let's say you want to take one gram out of this. So what you're going to do is put the entire sample on a balance and over here have the container you're putting your one gram into. So you'll take a little bit out of the sample and you put it into here and the mass will go down by like 0 0.05. And then you take a little bit more and it'll go by down by 0 0.1 or 0 0.1. And then eventually you'll get to one gram that you'll put in here. And that's what it means by difference. You actually put the whole thing on here and you take it away and you watch the negative number and you make sure that you've taken away one gram. That keeps um, most of the sample from soaking up a lot of water because you get to keep the lid on it at most times. All right, so there's some errors. Um, temperature fluctuations. So let's say you actually have a hot sample or you're trying to weigh a sample that's hot. It will actually create a convection current, um, which is essentially a, like an updraft of the cooling of the sample. And, and that's actually going to create um, a, a lower temperature or a lower, excuse me, mass than probably ought to be there. Fingerprint oils. So let's say you touch it and then all of a sudden um, your fingerprints have mass, by the way, your, your oil and your, and your fingers have mass and you can normally get away with that by using tweezers or, um, forceps or something to that effect or Kim wipes, which are those, uh, you've probably seen them. They come in a box. They're like tissues, but they're really hard and you wouldn't want to use them on your nose. Uh, air currents. So most balances actually have, um, a cover. So you want to use the cover. On, on a balance. Otherwise, the, just the regular draft of the room will actually cause the, the measurement to go up and down, especially when you're working in this lower end range. Sometimes your balance might not be level, and that can obviously affect the results. Um, to test this, you can stand on a scale that you have at home, if you have a weight scale, and just have it sit at an angle, and you'll be like, whoa, I gained 20 pounds or I lost 20 pounds. It's pretty cool. Placement of the object. If you don't place it directly on the center, you're obviously, it kind of creates a similar problem to it being on level. So you want to make sure you put it straight on the center. Um, magnetic objects. So if you're weighing something that's magnetic on an analytical balance that works 
via magnetism, you're going to have a, an issue. And so usually you can just put something like a, like a spacer of some sort that's going to elevate that object, either uh, maybe a piece of rubber, a rubber stopper, or even an upside down beaker, etc. And that will elevate it so it's no longer um, within range. Then we have room temperature changes. It's a minimal effect, but if you're doing something in a room that say doesn't have any air conditioning or um, or maybe you're doing some kind of analytical balance outside, I'm not sure. But if your temperature range is actually changing like 20 or 30 degrees, that's a big deal. Um, so you want to make sure that, that you're consistent in your measurements and you're keeping track of the temperature. All right, buoyancy. So um, if you think about a bathtub, and let's say you got water that's right here, and then you get in the bathtub, there's you. Yay, you have time to sit in the bath. You're not in college anymore. Just kidding. And what's going to happen is that water level is going to rise. It displaced by the volume that you are, right? Well, the same thing happens with air. So get this. When you calibrate a balance, I'm going to draw it now like this because oftentimes um, the balance will be inside a cage like we talked about. It'll have a door on it. So this will be like the little door and you open the door and you put the sample right in there. Now, when you calibrate a balance, there's all this air in there, right? But when you go to put a sample in, and so you put a sample in that you want to measure, it's whatever this beaker thing is. When you put a sample on that balance, what happens is now you've displaced the air that was in there when you originally calibrated it. So you're actually underestimating the mass of this thing because you've displaced the air that was originally in there. So true mass is actually measured in a vacuum. Now there are calculations that take buoyancy into account. Um, I have never particularly worked with anything that uh, was affected by the mass of the air. And I've worked in milligram samples before in industry, but uh, if you want to learn the calculation of buoyancy is in chapter two, and I suggest you can check it out um, if you're interested. All right. Let's move on to some glassware. Glassware, TC, you'll often see, is written um, on the side of glass. It'll say TC, 50 milliliters, 20 degrees Celsius. And that will oftentimes be written, let's say, um, I, I shouldn't be drawing. I'm going to actually change this to D, TD. We'll talk about it on the other side because I started drawing a pipette and that wouldn't make sense. So. Um, it'll be written like this on the side and you're like, hey, that's a pipette. It's 50 milliliters. TD means to deliver. So to contain, if glassware has a TC on it, that means it's meant to contain that amount. So this is usually um, things that you're not going to take from one container and pour into another container. So this is going to be like beakers, flasks. And that's pretty much the majority of them. Um, round bottom flasks, etc. cetera. Um, so this stuff will almost always have TC on it because it's calibrated to contain whatever volume it tells you. Then we have TD. TD is different. TD is to deliver, meaning it's calibrated to deliver that particular amount. So if the mark for 50 milliliters on this pipette that I drew, uh, drew is right there, that means when you fill it up to this mark, it is, it's going to deliver 50 milliliters. It doesn't mean 50 milliliters is contained in there, but it will deliver 50 milliliters um, into another container or whatever. And that's going to be generally burettes and pipettes, syringes, etc. All right, so let's talk a little bit about burettes. I believe I posted a video for you, which discusses them, nevertheless. Let's go over a few little things. All right, so burettes, again, are TD. They're calibrated to deliver a certain amount um, of a certain volume, I should say, instead of amount. I like to use the correct words, and I tend to um, get a little bit lazy sometimes, so I'm going to really try to start using the correct terminology. All right, so a Class A 
which is one of the best BRS that you can have, um, that's 50 milliliters, will still have a tolerance of 0.05 milliliters. That means whatever you uh, actually measure is going to be plus or minus 0.05 milliliters of that exact measurement. So let's take a gander at this thing right here. I'm gonna actually zoom in, although I guess you guys have it. So let's say I ask you what the measurement of this is. I chose this picture because I thought this was really, really funny. This is not the meniscus. That's the meniscus, the bottom of this thing right here. And so if I asked you what volume this thing has, well, this is 34 and this is 35. And remember, when you're doing a burette, and I'm, I'm assuming that you guys have already taken Gen Chem 1 and 2 labs, what happens is your burette is like this. You fill it to a certain line, and you open your stopcock down here, and the liquid goes out down here, right? Into another container. And so the volume level is just going to continue to go down. So that's why when we're looking over here, the volume level is going down. In other words, here you would have delivered 34 milliliters, but right here you would have delivered 35 milliliters. And these graduation marks are between 34 and 35, and there's nine of them, which tells me this is 34.1, 34.2, 33, 0.4, And it looks to me that this line is really, really close to 0. 0.6, but not quite there. And so this number would be 34.5, some might say eight, I'm gonna say nine milliliters. And that actually doesn't matter all that much because even if you're reading it incorrectly, one of the beautiful things about this is that it has a tolerance. So let's say this is a class A 50 milliliter burette. What that means is that the measurement wasn't just 34.59 milliliters and that's it. It has a tolerance, so it was actually 34.59 plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters. So when we go to calculate the range, you can go ahead and subtract the 0 0.05, so that looks like 34.54 to 34.64 milliliters. So somewhere in that range. All right, some vocabulary you wanna know when you're dealing with burettes are the following. So let me flip this around there for you. Titrant, that's the stuff in the burette. And parallax. That's, so let me kind of go back here. If I put, for example, water inside the burette, my titrant is water. If I put sodium hydroxide, NaOH, in the burette, my titrant is NaOH. Um, and parallax error. So parallax error occurs when somebody's not looking at this just straight on. So, for example, if I looked at it up here or looked at it down here, it would all create a different um, volume when I'm looking at it. So you want to look at this straight on even if that requires a little bit of workout on your part, scooch down, look at it at eye level, and get a good idea of what it is. Um, you can actually just see parallax air happening in your groups. Um, so this is when you look at the meniscus. From different levels. and an error occurs. So you can see this if you look at your different group um, members, you could ask four people to read a measurement and oftentimes you'll get varying answers. You wanna make sure if everybody's looking at it straight on that you get the exact same answer, otherwise you have parallax occurring. Magic flask. Huh. That's random. Um, I didn't mean for this next picture to be so big. But this is a flask used to contain a specific volume. So 
And again, two contained, so it'll say TC. Oftentimes, um, volumetric flasks don't look as pretty as, uh, this is more like an Erlenmeyer flask. Volumetric flasks will oftentimes look like this. Where they've got a rounder bottom and a narrower neck. And they'll usually have a line right here. Sometimes that line is really, really light. It's very difficult to see. So it would say something like this to contain. Let's say it's a five milliliter, a little tiny one, five milliliters, and it'll say 20 degrees C. And so you know that at five milliliters, or that at 20 degrees C, it will contain five milliliters if, you menis if the meniscus is right at that line. One thing you want to be careful of is when you're using a, a flask that you don't fill it too fast because this neck right here <laughs> fills up very quickly and you've probably experienced this and gone above this particular amount. So I also posted a video on volumetric flasks. I hope you check it out. Okay, so for this next one, sorry I didn't write filtration on here, um, but the topic is filtration. If you have ever had a cup of coffee or made a cup of coffee, you generally have an idea of how filtration works. It's a way to suck solid stuff out of heterogeneous mixtures, in other words, um, mixtures that maybe aren't fully, um, that, that aren't fully mixed or that contain solid particulate in them. So um, here, this, is, this happens to be one way to set up a filtration system. There are various ways, and I guess we can, we can talk about them relatively quickly. Uh, one thing that you might not have ever seen is using a stirring rod here uh, to help direct the liquid into the actual filter itself. Um, here, this is called a Buchner funnel. It's a funnel that can withstand the pressure of a vacuum. Um, and it's connected with a little rubber. Um, a rubber stopper here and it's just going to go all the way through and the filtrate's going to come out and it will collect all the little solid or whatever happened to be in the solution will end up on the filter paper down there. Um, again, you want to use a stirring rod to kind of direct it. The liquid will come right through here, keeping the solid in this particular area. Now, this isn't super analytical. There are some issues with this particular technique, one being that the filter paper tends to not uh, cover the entire area of the funnel. And so particulate can kind of go around. And if you look at the filtrate, even in this picture, you can kind of see that there's some solid left over. Um, there are other ways you can filter via gravity. So for example, you can use like a glass funnel. You can take a piece of filter paper and it actually goes through how to, um, how to fold your filter paper in the book. But you do want to fold it kind of in a triangle um, shape and a, and a cone that's going to not have any gaps on the side. And it walks you through exactly how to do it. It's like a four or five step process. In this particular setup, you can actually have this run either directly into a beaker. This is a really simple setup. Or you can maybe even have a glass, uh, an arm like over here come out and hold the filter. And you simply just pour your liquid through liquid containing the sample. And just let gravity do its job and you'll end up with a sample in here. So those are two methods. Probably the most um, utilized analytical technique is neither of these. It's the following. It's using a crucible and it will help us um, kind of walk us into the next section. Uh, a crucible is generally uh, made out of porcelain or ceramic, and it kind of looks like this. And there's usually a connector that will connect it to the funnel itself. And you can have something like this, and you can have a stem on here going to the vacuum. But again, because this is, uh, not this, because this is made out of porcelain, You can actually take this part off and you can have filter paper in there or some of them don't even require you to have filter paper in there. You can take this particular part off after it's been filtered. It looks like this and you can put this directly in an oven. Why you would want to do that is this particular technique will dry things but uh, it, because it's got a vacuum it will dry it but not that well. You'll still have, for example, if this were water in here mixed with a particular solid, this 
paper is still gonna be kind of wet. Um, and water has mass and you won't be able to figure out the exact mass of this stuff. Um, also, you have the, the solid going on the sides and that's not going to help you figure out exactly how much of a particular solid might have been in your solution. In this case, all you have is the filter paper. So when you pull the filter paper out, um, a variety of things can happen. One, it can, um, it can tear. Two, and two, it can break open. Um, and three, you have to find a way to take this sample out, unfold it, and put it in the oven. Then we have this situation where we have a crucible. Crucibles work really, really well um, because you can throw it directly into the oven and figure out what um, what exactly you had in there, exactly how much of something you had in there. Now, generally, you'd want to put like a lid on it. So what that means is before you even filter it out, you would actually mass this thing uh, and find out its exact mass, including the lid. You'd put it on here, um, get the fil um, get the stuff, the, the analyte that you're interested in. It's a word we didn't go over. And then put it directly in the oven so it can dry. Then you can take this thing out and we'll talk about what to do next when we talk about drying here. So most things, glassware, um, reagents, precipitates, etc., are dried in an oven at about 110 degrees Celsius. That's where the standard oven is set um, for at least one hour. Now, it's not always 110 degrees. For example, if you have something that's volatile at um, that temperature, or even lower than that temperature, or has a, a really, really low boiling point, you're going to want to adjust this. Um, 110 makes sense because it's just a little bit higher than the boiling temperature of water. So. Um, you're going to remove them with gloves. <laughs> if you've ever removed something from an oven, you know that you probably ought to have gloves on. Um, and by gloves, I mean the temperature safety kind of gloves or those little horrible mitts that do nothing that seem like every university loves to put them in there, but they really do nothing for you at all. And they're just totally unsafe. All right. Uh, so you want to take it out and you want to put it in a desiccator to dry. You don't want to just put it back on a table because the there's tons of water in the atmosphere and if you put it back on a table it, it could be hygroscopic enough to soak that right back up all right so what a desiccator is you've probably seen one of these before it's a big glass vessel usually has a a false bottom with a bunch of holes in it and down here is where you put the desiccant There's a table in your book in chapter two that goes over the various different drying agents or desiccants. Um, the most common one is probably dry right, also known as calcium sulfate. Then there's this lid right here. And if you've, and then they even have a, an oil that they put all around here to make sure it seals really, really well. And this is where almost every single person who's new to a lab struggles because they all try to pull up on the lid and you want to make sure you actually slide the lid off. You're going to slide the lid off, put your hot sample inside, and then slide the lid back on. And that will allow um, your sample to dry and not soak up additional water. Then you can take it directly over to um, an analytical balance where you can mass it and find out exactly how much is there based on the original mass of the crucible. All right, um, let's see, calibration of glassware. So you actually will have a lab where you're given information to calibrate glassware. I believe that, that posts in two weeks, I think. So you guys got a little bit of time, but not a whole lot. And so I kind of wanted to go through this briefly and give you an example calculation. So so if an empty weighing bottle so just some kind of weighing something, has a mass of 10.313 grams. So you weighed it, and then you added some water from a 25 milliliter, in other words, a two to liver, 25 milliliter pipette, pipette, pipette. So you added it, 
and then you measured it again. The mass of everything all together was 35.225 grams. And you want to know exactly how much you put in there. Well, mass-wise, you can figure out how much mass of water you put in, right? Because you know that afterwards it weighed 35.225, and initially it was 10.313. In other words, that's 24.912 grams of water that you put in there. But the question is, what's the volume? Yeah, it says 25, but we already know that there are certain tolerances and it's not gonna be exactly 25. And so we wanna know how many milliliters this is. Now before now, you might have used the density of water is one gram per milliliter. And that's correct to one significant figure. But there's a table and I don't, I didn't write it down in your book, which actually walks through the volume of water per one gram of, of water at any given temperature. And so at 27 degrees, it says, hey, that a gram of water actually has a volume of 1.0045 milliliters, not one. And so now we can use our dimensional analysis skills that we should have reviewed. So 24.912 grams. If this is grams, we have to put grams down here. We know a gram contains 1.0045 milliliters. And this actually um, accounts for the expansion that would occur even of the glassware. So that table that you have actually has an adjusted um, corrected value for these numbers. And if you do this, you get an answer of, and if you've watched my videos, you know that this is multiplying, grams cancel. So 24.912 times 1.0045 gives you 25.024 milliliters. So it wasn't 25.00000, it was 25.024 milliliters. All right. Last but not least, we have Microsoft Excel. Okay, here's where I'm going to get real with you. I care about you guys a lot. And when I was in uh, industry and when I was in grad school, one of the best assets I had is that in high school, I had to learn Microsoft Excel. It saved me a day's worth of time. It saved me so much time to truly understand Microsoft Excel. Now I've been teaching for six years, and the one thing that I've noticed that most students don't have any idea about is Microsoft Excel. And they sit there and you guys will calculate things via hand, and you have no idea exactly how it works, and you don't even realize the asset that you're missing. So I posted a 17 minute video The voice is super annoying, no offense to the computer voice on it, but it's going to be worth your time to watch it, you guys. Um, I expect you to understand Microsoft Excel and so will your future employers. So it's really, really important that you not only just have a general idea of how it works with a 17 minute video, but that you try to use it throughout the semester and actually employ those new things that you've learned. So I'm begging you. Watch that 17 minute video, be amazed, be wowed, and save yourself tons of time in calculations and writing up lab reports. So yeah, I think that's about it, y'all. Hope you have a wonderful week. Bye.